we're not here to live in the shadows of anyone. We're here to stand on the shoulders of all giants that have demonstrated exemplary status in tune, on target, and on track with what's really, truly inspiring and meaningful to them. Your life is your masterpiece. And I think that that's uh, the very title itself kind of calls you into wanting to master your life and make a masterpiece out of it. I had the opportunity to meet with a gentleman who was a famous painter and uh, his paintings have been basically sold around the world. And he did a painting for me and I watched him uh, do some of the painting and he would get into an, enter into a zone where I don't think he was anywhere but in the painting. It was really quite interesting. He was very present. He was very clear and certain. And he saw in his mind's eye the, the image. And his paintings, popes and prime ministers and many people around the world has, have utilized. And he did a painting for me called Angels and Demons, which is a, a pair of opposites that I asked for. And the watching him do his work and create his masterpiece, and they are masterpieces. It's like a Salvador Dali of today. Watching him work and watching him present was inspiring. You could not not watch him without almost a welling up inside, a tear in the eye. And I was many years ago in the 1990s, early 90s, about 1990 in fact, I was in Mexico and I took a group of my students down into the interior of Mexico. And we studied the Mayans, the Aztecs, the Olmecs. We studied the cultures. We went to many of the ruins. We toured all over Mexico, literally. The whole country, we covered much of it. And we came upon uh, a place where the famous black pottery, the Rosa family, created the black pottery masterpieces. And Mrs. Rousseau had, had done it for literally nearly a century. And now her son, who started when he was three to four, was there. And he was probably 60 or so at the time. And we watched him take mud, literally raw mud that still had stuff in it. And I watched him with his hands, with his eyes closed, go through and pull out debris inside the mud and toss it to the side onto a, a sheet. And I watched him then put water with it. And I watched him make the mud and anything that wasn't, um, that had a, a, a rock or something in it, he pulled out. It was amazing watching him. This was real raw mud <laughs> from the ground. And I watched him prepare the mud for this pottery. And then he had a coconut shell on top of a reversed coconut shell, half and half, that swiveled and, and pivoted on this coconut shell sitting on this uh, box, this, uh, like you could say, it's like a cart, carton. And um, he spun it with his hand once he got the mud prepared. And he added a little bit more water to make sure the mud was the right consistency. And then he took a glop of the, the mud and he put it on, on top of the, the uh, spinning coconut shell. And I watched him then start to form it with his hands. His eyes were closed the entire time. And I watched him start to form and to mold, spinning this coconut shell on top of a coconut shell. This is the original format that his mother had done, the structure, the way he did it. And I watched him start to form some pottery. Now, what was amazing is as he's starting to form it, it's coming into shape and it's spinning and it's spinning amazingly. I don't know how he did it. We, we tried to do it, none of us could do it. There's a group of us after we finished. No, none of them could do it. It, it, it was like a, an art. And we watched him form this black pottery. And as he's spinning it, he's taking another piece of mud and he throws it on there, literally perfectly, he rolls it and he throws it on there and makes a handle and then smooths it every time it goes around. And this thing is spinning really rapidly. He smooths it, smooths it, smooths it, makes a handle. And he does it on the exact opposite side and makes a perfect handle. And then each of his fingers he had carved into different nail shapes. So his nails had different designs on it. And he could literally with his fingers carve different designs onto the black potter as it's spinning and making zigzags and making lines and, and making uh, 
marks that I don't know how he, he combined his fingers to make uh, images of of little animals and things. I mean, it was just it was unbelievable to watch. And I looked around at my my students, and each of them were in tears because they realized they're in the they're in the presence of a master working, making his masterpiece. Now, I had a group of students with me. I don't think anybody walked out of there without buying at least three hundred dollars worth of pottery. Watching that, you had to you had to take that because you knew what was involved in creating it. <clears throat> and he had a warehouse, and people were selling it. It was a giant warehouse. And this guy had been making pottery for about sixty years, and uh, fifty-seven years, I think. And this warehouse was full, so he does it from early in the morning till probably late at night, and he makes pottery. He's doing what he loves. And uh, he closes his eyes and he did the entire thing without looking at it. It was a masterpiece. He saw it in his mind's eye. And he had let his body do it. Now, he refined it and he mastered his skill. But it's kind of like Michael Phelps when he goes out and gets 22 gold medals by seeing it in his mind's eye. We have in our brain a forebrain and a sort of a hindbrain area, midbrain, hindbrain. And the forebrain has the advanced foresight capacity with the executive center. And the hindbrain has the capacity to survive. One is thrival and excellence and masterpiece, making a master out of your destiny. And the other is survival and reaction. One's pro-action, one's reaction. One's foresight, one's hindsight. One learns by seeing it in the mind's eye ahead of time and creating it as a masterpiece. One is reacting and impulsive and instinctual responses to external sources. So one's intrinsic and driven from within, one's extrinsic and reactive from without. If we wanna make our life a masterpiece, the mastery of the inner intrinsic calling is more important than the extrinsic reacting. And that only occurs when we have learned to govern our own emotions. Warren Buffett says, until you can manage your emotions, don't expect to manage money. And Robert Greene in his 48 Laws of Power says, until you can manage your emotions, the single most thing that undermines leadership is not knowing how to overrule and govern the emotions. Whenever we are able to take our emotions and you might say transcend them and neutralize them and not let them run our lives, we, uh, we have more masterful pathway. <clears throat> the executive area of the brain, the forebrain, is known for a number of capacities. It has connections into the visual cortex, V5, V6. You have a primary cortex in the occiput then you have secondary, tertiary, and as you go out, you get more and more associations and more and more connections to different areas of the brain. And V5 and V6 is one of the most associative areas of the cortex uh, for the visual. And what's interesting is you now have access to an infinite supply of possibilities in your brain, um, not just what you're seeing with your receptors of your eyes, but you, all the capacities. So instead of just receiving and perceiving what's in front of you, you can close your eyes and you can associate anything to it. And that area of the brain uh, is where we have original thinking, creative thinking. It's a more advanced aspect of our visual construct. Now this executive area goes directly to it. And therefore we have the capacity when we're living in our highest values, living in our forebrain and living by priority to have the greatest inspired vision. I've been teaching the Breakthrough Experience, one of my signature programs for many years now, 32 of us. And uh, what's interesting is whenever I see somebody ask the right questions, transcend emotions, balance out their perceptions, and watch the executive center come on online, all of a sudden they get a tear in their eye and they look up and they, you can see them seeing a new possibility, a vision. And the moment we're in our highest values, the moment we're living congruently, the moment we're living by priority, 
the moment we're objective, the moment we're centered and present, our executive center lights up that area and we have inspired vision. <clears throat> and I've been blessed when I was 17 years old, I was in the presence of a great teacher. And that night I had one of those moments and I saw a vision of what I wanted to do, to travel and teach. And that was a far stretch compared to what I was doing at the time. But it was so lucid and so clear that um, I later painted it painted by a famous painter. And it sits in my office as a reminder of the primary mission and vision that I've been on. And that clarity, once you hold your mind focused on it, if you don't waver from it, because it's inspiring to you, allows you to incrementally refine your actions and build incremental momentum in the achievement of that vision. And that's how you make your life a masterpiece. You make your life a masterpiece by defining it clearly of what you want. Every year I also teach a program called Master Planning for Life. And the whole purpose of that program is to start designing that. Most people live by duty by what they think they should be doing, ought to be doing, supposed to be doing by an external source. And they're conforming and subordinating to the world around them to fit into the herd. And to fit in because if not, they feel abandoned or abolished and they, 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 they're frightened. But the master is not the one that's the follower. The master is the unborrowed visionary. The one that comes up with an original creation from the experiences and associations in their own experience and adding that to their vision. And they follow that. And those with a vision flourish and those without a vision perish, as they say. And any detail you leave out of your vision is a detail that you end up have as a challenge along the way. And your vitality in life is directly proportioned to the vividness of that vision. So by prioritizing your life and staying focused on the highest priority and delegating lower priority things and figuring a way of being remunerated fairly and fulfilled in the area of the highest value, you're able to delegate and release yourself from things that self-depreciate you and scatter you and distract you and put you in your amygdala, which is the more of the hindbrain function, which is impulsive and instinctual. And impulsive is seeking things for pleasure and instinctual is avoiding things for pain, which are the two forms of distractions that distract our mind from being present and certain as a masterpiece creator. But the moment we actually prioritize, and stay focused and centered on a clear vision. Another part of the forebrain comes active, and that's the strategic planning center. The strategic planning center is able to discern out of all the associations and possibilities that it sees, the data that it needs in order to create what it, 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 it envisions. And what's interesting is the pulmonar nuclei of the thalamus is a filtering and gating mechanism that filters out all the possibilities and allows you to extract out the highest priority observations and sensations that allow you to create the wisest decisions. In other words, you have the highest level of awareness and potential when we're living by our highest values and that we filter out all of the extraneous things that distract us out of the infinitude of possibility to get down into the focus that we're creating. The moment we actually strategically plan, the purpose of strategic planning is to use our imagination not to create fantasies or to live in phobias, which is our amygdala, but to refine and see, if I was to do this, what are the consequences? If I was to do this, what are the consequences? And do something in advance and look and mitigate the risk and think of the possibilities and prepare for things so you have a plan of action that you follow that you know for certain that you're clear on where you're going. How are you going to get there? Those with a plan uh, are the people that go farther than people without it. Alec McKinsey in his time trap showed very clearly that the people at the top of the game of life plan more, delegate more, strategize more, and the people at the bottom react more and don't have foresight because they keep pursuing goals that aren't really goals, they're fantasies. And then they don't show up. And then they go, why bother planning? Because it doesn't ha happen anyway. Unless you know the distinction between a real objective and a fantasy, when you're setting goals, um, you're probably going to bang your head against the wall and be pursuing that which has no uh, accomplishment. 
In other words, pursuing something that has really a, a, a fantasy of one-sidedness and not both sides. An objective has both sides. You think of the upsides and the downsides and you prepare for the downsides. You meditate on the evils as the Stoics used to say, Marcus Aurelius emphasized, and you concentrate on the thing and knowing full well you're prepared for both sides. If you're in a relationship and you think there's gonna be all positives, no negatives, all support, no challenge, all kind, no cruel, all peace, no war, you're not prepared for the relationship. But if you understand that there's going to be both and you're prepared for both and you can handle both, you're mature enough to be able to handle a true relationship. Well, the same thing with the goal. A true and objective is when you're willing to and embracing both sides equally. A fantasy is when you wanna get rid of one half of it and only get the one half, the other half. And that sets you up for self-defeat. Now, once you strategically plan and you have your imagination, not imagining phobias or philias, but actually focusing on the, the the, all the things that could go wrong and how do you solve them and all the things that go right and how to prepare for them. When you do, you're now ready and now have a plan of action and you're now able to follow that plan. And people who have clarity of plans and know what to follow and just stick to those plans, strategies, they're better than impulses. I always say that to, unless you fill your day with high priority actions that are strategized towards an objective, your day is going to fill up with low priority distractions that are going to scatter you. The third aspect of the executive center is the spontaneous action. When you're living by your highest value, you're spontaneously active towards doing it. I spontaneously do my research every day. I don't have to be reminded to do that. If you need to be reminded to do what you say is important, what you say is important isn't important. One of the signs of the executive center, the pathway of mastery and refining skills is highly refined, specific, strategically followed actions that are spontaneous. You just do it. You know, as, as uh, Richard Brandon said, screw it, just do it. You just do it. You don't sit there and, and uh, wonder about it. You don't doubt about it. You just take action because you see it in your mind's eye. It's so clear. I've been teaching in the Breakthrough Experience uh, a love list where you actually write down what you would love to create in your life. And when people are really, really in their executive center, <clears throat> really in their forebrain, they feel when they're writing it becomes automatic writing. They don't have to edit it. It just comes fluently out. The degree of fluency you have in your life is based on the congruency you have. When you're setting a goal that's congruent with your highest values, you have fluency of expression, fluency of thought, fluency of action, and fluency of speech. So the moment you actually are really writing down on a love list what's really truly inspiring it's highest on your value that you see in your, your forebrain. You, you can't even write as fast as it pours out of you. It becomes an automatic writing. It doesn't require editing. It becomes almost inspired. You almost get tears in your eyes. Like, like Tom Cruise and Jerry Maguire when he was writing his mission statement and it poured out with tears in his eyes and he just, he had a clarity of what he was going to do. This is a sign of an illumination. This is a sign of an inspiration. This is a sign of a penetrating the mysteries of the unknown about how you want to create what's in your life, the strategy. And you feel that it's impossible for you not to fulfill it. You feel it's your destined. You're destined for it. It's your destiny. You can't not do it. When I'm writing down my dreams and my goals, I want it to come from that perspective. I want it to be so per perfectly clear in my mind's eye that that's the feeling I have. When you have that and you keep refining it, you can see it in your mind's eye. It's indelibly in front of you. And when you do, you spontaneously act. You can't wait to start on it. So you have inspired vision, strategic planning, and you tend to want to execute that plan. And the fourth thing about the executive function is there's fibers from that executive area, also down into the amygdala, that, have, that stimulate glutamate, which is a facilitative neurotransmitter, and GABA, which is an inhibitory one. And it monitors, regulates, and modulates, and moderates the impulses and instincts that normally distract people from their mission. When people are really on their mission, time, you don't notice it. You don't notice things. It just seems like the day just disappears. It's poof, because you're so present. When you extract out space and time from your mind and become present in an inspired focus and clear vision, and you can articulate it, the way you know you have a clear vision is you can articulate in your mind's eye what you're seeing. 
And there's no hesitancy. There's fluency. That's congruency. That's when you're on your highest value. That's when you're really in your masterpiece path. And it is impossible. And I say impossible to be in that state and return to that state and stay in that state as much as possible without creating a masterpiece out of your life. Why? Because you tend to walk your talk. You're not limping your life. You tend to expand your space and time horizons. And eventually the space and time horizons give you permission to create goals or even beyond your life. You create legacies. You create immortality. You leave an effect on the planet. And it's impossible for the people around you not to notice you because you're exemplifying what's possible. And all human beings yearn to express that masterpiece. So whoever walks the path of the master, whoever lives congruently and inspired, whoever's willing to go after a vision that's unborrowed, they automatically give permission for other people in a chain reaction to do the same. And they're drawn and magnetized to them. And the people, because they're fulfilling what's meaningful to them by seeing it, they feel that this is a charismatic individual that magnetizes them to them because they want to be around them. And whatever the vision is, they want to participate in it because of the reward that they're getting by being around something and exemplifying true vision. And so what happens is the people, places, things, ideas, and events, the synchronicities that the secret movie was talking about, they increase the probability of these synchronicities occurring in your life. And the, you're, you're in what uh, Jim Parker used to call the teleological naturally right state. The naturally right individuals, you know, even though some of you may or may not uh, appreciate Donald, but Donald Trump, but Donald Trump gave me a, a really interesting little affirmation way many years ago, almost 30 years ago. I'm always at the right place at the right time to meet the right people to make the right deal. And I really believe that that's what starts happening. You enter into the science of being naturally right. You start to resonate. You start to be synchronously at the right place. You see things, you see opportunities. Your brain is now electrified and alert and awakened to what the vision is. So to create a life masterpiece, it's clearly defining what it is that you're going to create. You can't scatter yourself into infinitude. You can't be at the mercy of the impulses and instincts of all the distractions. It's when the voice and the vision on the inside is louder than all those opinions on the outside that you begin to master your life. And that's the path of the master. And making a masterpiece is refining it and refining and refining it. You know, I, I uh, some, sometimes write books and manuals for, for programs. I've done over 300 of those. And uh, these are books, some of them are a thousand pages. And when I do them, I work on them and I refine them. And over the years, I keep refining them. And I have my own master planning book which is 26 volumes, 26 volumes. And I've been working on it for all these years, 48 years. And my mission statement is sitting in there. And I've updated it 77 times in 48 years. I read it, I refine it, I read it, I refine it. And I don't stop until a tear of gratitude. Tears of gratitude are confirmations that you're in a moment of authenticity and you're clear and you're living by priority and your, your executive center is on. You're inspired. And this is the key to creating that masterpiece, giving yourself permission to be the authentic you and not distracting yourself about how you should be, ought to be, supposed to be, got to be, have to be, need to be, must be, according to those in living in mediocrity. We're not here to live in the shadows of anyone. We're here to stand on the shoulders of all giants that have demonstrated exemplary, exemplary status of positioning themselves in the, in the zone in tune, on target, and on track with what's really truly inspiring and meaningful to them. When you do, you live a meaningful life, the mean, the path of the center. You're centered. You're not eccentrically wobbling and you're not in uncertainty. You're in a state of certainty, you know your mission. I know my mission as a teacher. I've been doing it 48 years. I'm inspired today as I was when I started. I love what I'm doing. And I believe that that's what you deserve. That's why all my programs, all my seminars, all my little webinars, all these little messages, every single week, every day, throughout the day, it's all geared to that. Because you deserve to live an inspired life. You deserve to have a masterpiece. You deserve to have a meaningful, inspirational, fulfilling life. And I'm certain I've been spending the last 48 years studying the great masters, the great leaders, the great Nobel Prize winners, the great philosophers, the great spiritual leaders, the great business leaders in every field great sports leaders, 
what's common to them. And what I'm sharing with you is, is the basic principles. And I want to share those with you because I want you to do something extraordinary because I learned from Zig Ziglar, if I help you do something extraordinary, I get to do something extraordinary. We rise together. So your life is designed to be a masterpiece. The magnificence of who you are far, far exceeds any fantasies you'll put on it. So don't inject the values of others and try to be somebody you're not and be second at being somebody else. Allow yourself to be first at being you. You don't want to be a second Elvis. You want to be you. The magnificence of who you are is what matters. And that masterpiece of you comes from living by the highest priorities, most meaningful priorities you have in your life. That's why on my website, I have the value determination process to automatically gear you to help you identify what's really most important. Not what you think it is, not what you wish it would be, but what your life demonstrates it is. Because looking at what you spontaneously are inspired to do is the path of this mastery path. Mine is in teaching. Mine is in writing. Mine is in sharing ideas. But each of you have your own unique path. And even if it's simpler in teaching or coaching or healthcare or being an entrepreneur, whatever it is, it has a uniqueness. And it's and then we, we, if we're sitting there comparing ourselves to others instead of comparing our daily actions to our own highest values, we've already distracted ourselves. Don't look to the sides, laterally. Look in the center, look in your heart. Look inside the, your, what your eyes of vision bring and you'll make a masterpiece. And each time you do that, as you walk the path of the master, your space and time horizons are going to grow. And eventually you're going to have a celestial view, not just a terrestrial view. We always say that at the level of our soul, nothing's missing in us. At the level of our senses, things appear to be missing in us. And our soul calls us to a celestial vision. And when you have a celestial vision, as I was having dinner with Rupert Murdoch one time, and I asked him how he created his empire, he says, I, I hold a globe in my hand, and I spin it, and I ask, what message do I want to bring to what part of the world today? And he has a celestial view looking down on a terrestrial experience instead of a terrestrial view looking up. If you want to be on top of the world instead of the world on top of you, it's a celestial view. And that only occurs when we're living congruently according to what we value most and expanding our space and time horizons into a celestial perspective. And when we do, it's impossible. Nothing mortal down below can interfere with an immortal visionary. So prioritizing your life is essential for that. And having an astronomical vision instead of a little terrestrial uh, distraction. So give yourself permission to shine, not shrink, to stretch, not uh, shrink, and uh, give yourself permission to go out and do something amazing. And and if, if you know inside you there's an emergent leader, so give yourself permission to live by what that is true leadership that you want to be. Give yourself permission to be the leader in your field, to be great at what you do, to be number one at what you do, to be the greatest at that. And you'll create a masterpiece. So I just wanted to share that and spend a little time with you today to focus you on the highest priority because I want you to do something extraordinary with your life. There's nothing more inspiring than to get emails from students around the world who've accomplished amazing things, sent out and, and uh, done things that were extraordinary, shared what their vision was and went out and did it. That's the most inspiring thing that goes into my gratitude book today. So by you going out and doing that, I win too. Now, hopefully that idea of, of making your life a masterpiece, at least what I said, will, will, will now take you forward today. Use it as a catalyst to do something even more extraordinary today. But I want to share with you something as a gift that will help you in this, this journey of the masterpiece. And that is awakening your astronomical vision. This is a live presentation I did in Johannesburg in a planetarium to a group of executives of YPO. And this is a, these are leaders in their fields. And I did a, a, I really knocked it out of the ballpark that night and talked about how to have an astronomical vision and, and listen to it about five or six times. What will go into your head and what will come out of your life will be worth this, this uh, gift. Whatever it is, if you don't have this gift, get this. Just take the time to do it. dmartini.fm slash gift to claim it. It's a $50 value, but I promise you, if you listen to this over and over again, you'll say thank you. It's, it's, uh, it was an inspiring night, without a doubt. You will not watch this or listen to this 
And you'll probably watch it because you'll probably close your eyes while you're listening to it and see it in your mind's eye. But as you do, it will help you move forward on your catalytic masterpiece. So I want you to do that. And also, uh, we do this, this, this little uh, webinar every week, so please join me. But we also have a special webinar, and this is going to be how your psychology affects your physiology. It's a free masterclass, but it's basically, it's demartini.fm slash 65. And this is what you're, what you're thinking, how it affects your body, its health and vitality. And I'm going to be going through what your, how your psychology literally autonomically and epigenetically, how it affects your physiology and what your physiology is telling you, the relationship. So how to read your body and how it's, what it's whispering to you. So you want to take advantage of that. So grab this free gift at Awakening Your Astronomical Vision and sign up for the class. I promise you that uh, it'll be an inspiring class. If you got something out of this class, you will definitely get something out of that class. Thank you for joining me for this presentation today. If you found value out of the presentation, please go below and please share your comments. We certainly appreciate that feedback. And be sure to subscribe and hit the notification icons. That way I can bring more content to you and share more to help you maximize your life. I look forward to our next presentation. Thank you so much for joining me.